Good afternoon and welcome to part two of the United States Patent and Trademark Office 2022 Black Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program. My name is Jade Stewart and I'm the National Outreach Partnership Specialist representing the Office of Innovation Outreach at the USPTO. I will be your host for the program as we hear from our nation's top leaders and entrepreneurs who will share the importance of investing in your ideas and businesses, as well as USPTO officials who will share pertinent information and resources for aspiring inventors and those who want to know more about the patenting intellectual property process. If for any reason you get disconnected, you can log back into the program at any time using the live stream link that brought you here. If you miss a portion of the program, do not worry. We'll be posting the presentations online for you to review information, as well as re-engage with all of our speakers through our webpage in a few weeks. Now, I am thrilled to welcome the USPTO Deputy Commissioner for Patents, Robin Evans, who will share some opening remarks to kick off today's event. Welcome, Robin. Thank you, Jade. Uh, I appreciate your introduction. Let me tell you, I am so happy to be here. I am excited about this program. Today, uh, we have an amazing group of innovators and subject matter experts. And I just know that we are going to learn a lot today. Uh, many of you already know what intellectual property is. You know that it broadly covers innovations related to patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets. I hope you also know that intellectual property is deeply rooted in our nation's history, and it even finds support in the U.S. Constitution, that authors and inventors have exclusive rights to their respective writings and discoveries for a limited time. That means you have the right to protect your invention. Um, protecting your invention, your creating, ensures that no one has the right to use it without your permission. And that's the cornerstone of the ideology of intellectual property protection. And so I don't know if any of you were here last week for part one of this uh, webinar, but one of the things that, that I remember hearing in that journey was that some of those folks had not protected um, their inventions uh, previously. They heard other people using their ideas and they said, oh my goodness, let me get protection. And so they went about protecting what was rightfully theirs, their discovery. And that put them in charge, right? It let people know, I have the right to control who can use what I created. And that's what protection is all about. You don't want to be on the back end of trying to get someone or tell someone you created something first. Make sure that you are reaching out, um, that you're getting your, your invention, your discoveries uh, protected so that you can be in the deciding seat and deciding who uses what you created. I heard some other folks last week say, I allowed others to use it because it was about the community and it was about the growth, right? And that's what intellectual property protection is all about too. It's about the economic growth, right? It's, it's using what is already available to the public to build on. And your name will be forever attached to those things that um, people use to build upon, to create other, other inventions, other ideas, other things that we are putting out into the public that makes our economy great. Um, but the one thing I, I would like to say is that as African Americans, as Black people, we have created a lot. We have invented a lot in nearly every technical, technical field we have created. But, you know, in the recent years, the number of African American patentee holders has, has dwindled and it's gone down and it, and it has not changed. And we want to 
make a change in, in that. So we want to make sure you get the information that you need to become a patent holder, to understand what that gives you. Um, it will open up a lot of doors for you. It's about prestige. It's about ownership. It's about investments. It's about wealth, generational wealth. It's about having your name written down beside what you created that will last forever, right? It's about that building block. I'm happy to say that um, this year in the National Inventors Hall of Fame, we are inducting Marion Croak um, and the late Dr. Patricia Bath, two African-American women that, that are just phenomenal. And Lonnie, Smo excuse me, um, Lonnie Johnson, who you may know created the, the super soaker. Um, but Dr. Patricia Bath, the, the late Dr. Patricia Bath, maybe you guys don't know her, but she created um, the early, uh, the early surgeries uh, that that went along with removing cataracts. And so, as you know, a lot of people with with trouble with their vision, um, that that was just phenomenal, right? And and we are still doing those surgeries today. And uh, Marion Croak is is accredited with voiceover IP. So talking over the internet, and they'll be inducted. At, 2022 inductees. And so all of that is why we should protect and learn to protect and want to protect um, our inventions as, as a, a people, right? As inventors, as a creative force in this, in this nation. The PTO, the USPTO has a lot of initiatives and programs to help people as they you know, start on their journey. As a matter of fact, if they're in the middle of their journey and or they're at the end of the journey. And so later on, you will hear about a lot of the initiatives we have going on a lot of the um, places that you can connect. If you need help, we have our website. I invite you to go to our, our website. Um, you know, we have a lot of things that we can help you and we want to help you along the way and just not at our office. We partnered with a lot of different places. Many of you may have heard about patent and trademarks resource centers. Those are in your regions near you. Uh, we have a lot of uh, four other regional offices that will help you wherever you are. So we wanna meet you wherever you are, right? And so today I want you to make sure you take note. We have some dynamic, panel members coming up. I, I'm excited to hear what they, they have to say. I'm going to be taking notes. I encourage you to take notes as well. I encourage you to be inspired and I encourage you to be innovative. I also encourage you to make sure you protect all that, all that you do. So again, thank you. Welcome. Enjoy the program. And I, with that, I'll turn it back over to Jay. Thank you so much, Robin, for that exciting information and overview. And with today's theme, investing in your ideas and discoveries to protect your intellectual property, not only drives economic growth, but also helps you create a living legacy. So for this first segment, I'm excited to introduce our panel who will discuss just that, using your creativity to create generational wealth. And we feature four or three panelists and our moderator, James Wilson of the USPTO. So I'd like to introduce Tani Chambers of Raven, Ebony Boyd of Budget Collector, and James Howard of the Black Inventors Hall of Fame to the stage. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm James Wilson. I'm the Assistant Regional Director of the Elijah J. McCoy Midwest Regional Office in Detroit. It is a great pleasure and an honor for me to follow Helen Bryan Johnson and Alfred Kindred as a moderator in this Black Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program series. Last Wednesday, Alfred and Helen engaged 
successful innovators and discuss networking, business strategies, and securing funding with Lanny Slew, Janet Emerson Bashan, Morgan DeBron, and Stacy Spikes. Today, I bring you part two of this series while I, where I will engage Ebonique Boyd, Connie Chambers, and James Howard, three amazing Americans who have invested in their own ideas. I hope to engage this panel in a manner that will allow you, the listener, to obtain useful tips for success, the advantages and opportunities in, for investing in intellectual property and building wealth. Each is an influencer in their own right. I'm gonna start out with a general question that I would like for this August body to answer. And I'm gonna ask, I know it's usually ladies first, but I'm gonna ask James Howard to start us off. And the question that I'm going to pose, and ladies, if I need to ask it again, please let me know. The question that I would like to ask is, what has been the impetus or defining moment in your journey that set you on your current trajectory and helped you achieve your creative success? James? Thank you, Brother James Wilson. I appreciate that question. And thank you, Jay Stewart, for bringing me on board for this important event. Well, James, for me, that answer comes in two parts. The first part is back in 1980, when I was told by my senior instructor in college that I really should reconsider my career choice and that there was probably not a future for me in the field of industrial design. And in spite of that, I went and knocked on 14 doors and got nothing but no's utilizing my portfolio and came to the realization that if I was going to be successful in this field, I probably have to get back in school. So I went to grad school only to be told in the fall of that same year that I ranked a zero compared to all the other graduate students and that I had no business being in the program. Now, that's part one, and part one actually concluded with me winning an international design award, designing the biofeedback system for cerebral palsy kids. But it wasn't until I met this gentleman right here in part two, the late, great Charles Harris, the designer of the Master that we all would have grown up on. It wasn't until I met him while in grad school, still uncertain of my future, that I saw the enormity of his efforts of an illustrious 40-year career as Sears Roebuck's first Black executive and one of the most profound and prolific industrial designers that this country has ever seen, let alone Black. And it wasn't until I met him, he looked at me and said, James, don't pay attention to the naysayers. This is what you want to do there's a path for you. And that's when my trajectory was set to the point where I was not gonna let anyone change my trajectory. So, so a really quick statement about that trajectory. James Howard is an experienced thought leader in the field of design thinking. He's an accomplished design professional and a design historian, a serial entrepreneur, with a demonstrated history of advancing the cause of design and innovation. Skilled in leadership, career counseling, adult education, entrepreneurship, and public speaking, he is a strong educational professional with a master's of fine arts in industrial design from the University of Illinois at Chicago. As an innovator and a designer, Mr. Howard has amassed more than 18 patents on everything from household appliances to cardiovascular delivery systems to neonatal pressure relief valves. For nearly 15 years, James Howard owned and operated one of the country's leading minority-owned industrial design firms, Howard Design. He is the co-founder of the Black Inventors Hall of Fame and executive producer of the Black Inventors Hall of Fame films. I am so glad. A statement that I've heard, and I've heard it just like you've heard it. My name is James, too. And I, there have been times when I've been told you're in the wrong place, you're doing the wrong thing, and you don't belong. And I'm thankful 
that. I had what a little bit of what you have, a lot of, and that's some intestinal fortitude to move forward and to not allow what other people say dictate how I conduct myself and how I proceed. Thank you, James. I really appreciated that answer. My absolute pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely. Ladies, I am going to pose the same question to you. And um, if one of you would like to go first, I will allow you the opportunity to move into this space. I'll go. Um, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office Pro Bono Program for Inventors has been one of the key components to strengthen our business. Um, the app itself was pretty simple to create for us, um, but the key component of the app could be stolen really easily by someone who had more money and more connections. So in order for us to grow, um, we needed to explain our core idea to more powerful people. And by being able to write a patent and submit it, um, it gave us some, gave us a feeling of being able to um, talk to these important people without feeling like they're gonna come out and steal it from us. Because we have, I mean, the US government has some protections for everyone. And the, especially the pro bono program, um, we got connected to one of the top um, patent attorney firms in the country, Fredrickson and Byron. And I, we had a wonderful attorney submit our patent and gave us that confidence to continue our market research with the top entrepreneurs and top art museums. We're well, well overfunded and well overstaffed in us, but um, we were, were able to feel some level playing ground um, with the protection that we get from the patent office. Thank you, Ebonique. And Ebonique is an exceptionally diverse entrepreneur. She is the founder of Good Management and Investments, which developed new businesses in historically economically disadvantaged communities in Brooklyn, New York. She has served as a healthcare media analyst, analyzing, authoring, and editing dozens of multiple source summaries on topics ranging from health, medicine, diplomacy, and international politics for clients, including the White House. She has served as a political consultant and the executive director of the Council for International Visitors to Iowa Cities and product development and marketing lead co-founder of Budget Collector. She has developed several qualitative and quantitative research surveys on the art market, consumer hesitancy, and general art ecosystem, including market share analysis. Ebonique, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be on this panel. We want to make sure that people realize who's on this call with me because your credentials and what you bring to the table, outstanding. And so now I turn my attention to Ms. Chambers. And Ms. Chambers, the same question is presented to you. What is that, what is that seminal moment? What is that, that time period that set you on the trajectory that has led you to this creative success that you enjoy today? So there's been several several moments that I believe when I look back that have catalyzed um, where I am today. I think I'm always, I'm in a continue, continued pursuit of success, right? But I don't want to, um, you know, I don't want to not give credit to the accomplishments that I've achieved along the way, which as entrepreneurs, we often do. We're so focused on where we're going and what's coming that we don't take time to pat ourselves on the back for the stuff that we have done. <laughs> so I would say one moment that I'd like to share today is I watched a dear friend of mine who is an inventor. She might be listening right now. Um, who is an inventor? I watched her create an amazing invention, and then I watch her fall prey to predatory practices and essentially her idea be stolen, sold um, here in the U.S. and overseas. Um, and that, I, when I looked at that moment, I I know that it was 
a funding issue, right? It was a money issue. If she had the funding, if she had the wealth, if she could turn to family members, if she could even turn to me in that moment, and I could have written her a check to do the things that she needed to do, um, she may not have had that situation, right? And she may not have had to have uh, expensive learning <laughs> um, experience that she did. So that and, you know, honestly, <laughs> a, a, a milestone birthday. <laughs> I was 39 turning 40 and looking at my finances and wealth and the goals that I had set and wanted for myself and my family and, you know, my friends. And I was like, okay, this is not going to cut it. What is wrong? And I realized that investing, that I was pursuing entrepreneurship. I've been an entrepreneur for 20 years. I was pursuing entrepreneurship and having some successes, but I needed to start investing my money. And I didn't really know enough about it. And I, none of my friends knew. <laughs> and so we got together and when we seeked out advice, we kind of left feeling chastised or scolded or, you know, like, we're not interested in you kind of thing when you go talk to financial advisors. So we got together and we did our own thing and we, we learned and we brought people we trusted. And that was the genesis of Raven, you know? And now with the successes that we've had, we have to open this out to other Black women in the U.S. first and then eventually all around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Chambers is an exceptional businesswoman and entrepreneur in her own right. In her journey, Tani Work founded Wink Eco Beauty Bar and operated General ne Green Nail and Day Spa, providing eco chic beauty good for you or us and the earth. She has put in time as a small business education consultant and is the founder of Savvy Money, the CEO of Tani Chambers International and is the founder, CEO and alpha member of Raven. And Raven is a community and investment syndicate of emerging black and Afro-Latina women investors. This vetted network and community is a safe space to learn the fundamentals of investing and how to leverage it to create wealth, improve the quality of life, and impact the world. Ladies and gentlemen, this panel is a panel to listen to. So my next question, and it's a question for each of you, is how do you keep the momentum going? And how do you stay motivated in your space and where you are to get up in the morning and 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 then charge into the day. James, I'll start with you. You're muted. Okay. For me, James, it is often more of a matter of trying to find the off switch. Because being a trained designer, you learn that there's this innate quality to always be curious and to always be empathetic towards other people's needs and concerns. So for me, it's a matter of petrol optimism that I act upon every single day to ask, what can I do to make this world a better place, the next opportunity, the next given moment, so forth and so forth. So uh, practicing petrol optimism is how I pretty much keep it going, but occasionally, uh, the need to step back and observe more and to listen more uh, is a process that I call transcending to the second mountain, where there's more of an emphasis on being empathetic and caring and concerned for your fellow man. This is pretty much where I am right now in my uh, state of, of life to be uh, perpetually moving towards who I can help. And what concern can I address on a daily matter? And there's always concerns out there. So I'm always fueled uh, with that desire. Thank you, James. Mm -hmm. How um, do you keep them going and stay, and stay active and motivated in, in your field? Oh, I love the app. Um, so I love doing, I do in app interviews with my, um, 
we're still in, we're now in open beta and I always do app interviews and some of the comments that really get me going um, was one that a guy said, I could find my best friends through this app. And like when he said that, I, I still think that like that's what we're, that's where we're trying to go is like the way currently a lot of social media is designed. Uh, it's like the shallow connectedness where you're connected to people, but you just press a like or you write a little tiny comment and it's not this deepness that you can have with art. Um, and so the user comment that he gave me, like, I and he probably doesn't even know he inspires me this much. It's like one 30 minute user interview, but it always gets me going. And it's like always in the back of my head, like this is where we're, you know, he felt it right away, but like everyone should feel that right away when they're in the app. They're like, when you connect through art, that's powerful. And if we can more join as a community through art, like, I don't know, the next, the world will be totally better and, and different. So that keeps me going. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. Ms. Chambers. Wow. At least once a day, I feel like quitting, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> entrepreneurship is hard. Like, I want to be really honest with the people that are listening. Um, there's a lot was put forth that, you know, it's glamorous and, you know, all this glitz, but they don't talk about the grind. They don't talk about the hard work. Um, it appears that it happens overnight. It doesn't. And, you know, I can't do this without my tribe. So that's what keeps me motivated. I have a tribe of, in, um, a tribe of other uh, founders, right? So that moment in the day when I feel like quitting, they tell me why I can't. I also think about the mission. The mission is always, or should be, in my opinion, bigger than you. If And it can't be about money. So if it's about money and it's not bigger than you, then you will quit. Um, so it's hard and there are obstacles and there are challenges. But the fact that I have a tribe of other founders, I have a supportive tribe in family and friends, um, keeps me motivated and keeps me going. I would venture to say that each and every one of you derives energy and motivation from plugging into others and having others have an influence on what you do. You all are providing services, whether it's intellectual, whether it's art, or whether it's financial, each and every one of you is providing a service. And I just think that that's beautiful. Uh, my next question involves emerging markets and new technologies. How do you see your role expanding or involving or evolving in the business ecosystem? You know, I can go first this time and give James a break. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. So um, Raven is a fintech company or a financial technology company. Um, and so when we talk in it, fintech in itself is an emerging market. It is growing, but still somewhat in its infancy stages for the problems that need to be solved in the world. Um, so part of that for Raven um, and that market and how we fit into that is financial inclusion, right? financial diversity, um, education, uh, policies, making sure that um, the policies that are put in place, yes, through business and through technology, that the policies on technology, the policies in the financial area are fair, are equitable and inclusive and, are con and we are considered, our community is considered. Um, and we have a seat at the table that our voice is heard um, so that we're not left behind, right? And I think in our community, we understand how that has happened. And so also with, within the ecosystem, what we have is a growing um, demand for um, Black people who want to learn about investing, want to know about financial, they want to do more with their money and are willing to try. Um, black women, 78% of Black women want to invest but they don't because they lack the knowledge, which leads to lacking the confidence and they don't know where to start. So that's why we're here to help them do that. Um, and in, essentially that helps 
you know, that helps the entire the ecosystem. It helps the GDP in nationally and globally. So I would say that fintech, it's a bro it's broad, <laughs> but fintech in itself is definitely an emerging trend. And within that, financial inclusion and making sure that our technology and um, the financial policies are equitable. So fintech, financial technology. Yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I was like, fintech, fintech, fintech. Okay. In tech, everybody wants to shorten the words. <laughs> they want to shorten everything. So, yes. Absolutely. My two uh, uh, remaining panelists, would you like to dive into that question about uh, emerging oh, no. technologies and markets? Okay. It will be really quick because I haven't submitted that part of my patent. So, I'm staying quiet. <laughs> Absolutely. And no one here has signed a non-disclosure statement. So <laughs> we're going to ask you to hold on to that information, but thank you. No problem. What I'd like to enlighten the audience to, um, James, is the emerging technology of AI. Uh, this is a space that um, I think lots of people ought to turn their attention towards. This is where we're really moving. Uh, that along with the uh, 5G network, and things of that nature. These high tech areas right now, uh, from the West even to the East, um, is just ex emerging extremely. There are competitions that you can join. There are talk sessions that you can join. There are groups sessions you can join to learn more. But I would definitely advise the audience to consider AI, getting into that space, um, anything related to 5G and things of that nature. Uh, th these are the emerging technologies. What my school, Entrepreneurial U, is doing right now is offering up an apprenticeship and learning all of the things that are available to you along the space of IT. And all of these fall into that camp. So you can literally get an apprenticeship certificate just on engaging uh, an understanding of what's available to you in the IT space, but uh, there's no doubt that's really where I believe a lot of intellectual property um, are, is pursuing, and that's what I'm encouraging a lot of my students uh, today. So my question for you is, are the courses and the information that you're talking about, is this available to people virtually in this current environment? It, it, it actually was an outgrowth of COVID, uh, whereby I had originally had an account with the state to state of New Jersey to train long term unemployed adults careers and uh, new career pathways. Right. And then once COVID set in, there was a refocus from the state to start shifting more towards training the same long term unemployed adults for careers in IT. And so digging into the weeds of IT, we started discovering that these are areas that uh, we need to start turning our attentions towards. And it's basically a skill set of learning to apply design thinking, first and foremost, to some of these high tech areas so that you can develop the confidence, you can develop the soft skills necessary to navigate successfully within the space of high IT, high, uh, high level uh, IT. Thank you for that answering that question. So I have the opportunity and the joy of, of mentoring or being a part of a mentoring program where there are uh, 10 young African-American valedictorian, straight A students, uh, individuals who are looking to go to college and to be successful. And one of the questions that I got from them that I wanted to pose to you is, what three tools would you recommend to anyone trying to start their own business? Now, it doesn't have to be three, it could be one. But what would you recommend to a young person who is interested in starting their own business? What would you, where would you direct them first or what would be the first series of steps or things that you would investigate or, or have them investigate to move forward? And I know that it depends on the business, but yes. so I'll let I'll let you decide what you want to share and you can correlate it to any business that you see fit. 
Well, you know, interesting enough, there are some basic attributes that I believe could apply to any business pursuit. And that first and foremost one is one that I've already spoken on, and that is empathy. Develop the empathy for the space in which you would care to engage in. And that empathy is going to drive you deeper and deeper and deeper into that problem. And once you have the empathy, what you're going to then obtain is passion, the passion to pursue that area of interest. So without those two, you're really navigating a journey that's likely to go astray. And then the third one, and this is one that has pretty much propelled me to wake up every day and offer up my talents and my skills and my mentorship on a daily basis to young minded students. And that is to learn the soft skill set of design thinking. Because what that does is that allows you to think outside the box, break with normity, break with confined, being conformed into one narrow pathway and allows you to feel comfortable with thinking differently and moving in different directions. So these are the three traits that I try to imbue um, in my students, uh, empathy, passion, and again, embracing design thinking, which is essentially just a more creative way of thinking that operates more on the right side of your brain than that left side of your brain, which is actually set up to protect you and keep you in a comfortable zone. But I'm sure as Tani and Ebony will both agree, we didn't get where we're, have gotten today by being too comfortable. We have pushed against the grain, thought differently, and thought outside the box to achieve uh, great heights. Yeah, I would emphasize uh, the same. Um, I just, I was trying to think of different tools I use, but there's nothing essential. Um, it's more the people and the books and just remaining curious. Um, and then also not um, something that Tani was saying earlier was like, just don't rush into anything and be, you know, be okay with learning and not doing it for the money, but doing it because you can wake up every morning and do it. Um, so finding out your true passions and that's, that's being okay with not starting a business, you know, like understanding that sometimes it's not even, you know, like understanding that you're not passionate enough to, to do it. Um, if that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Because that, um, that uh, leads me into my next points, Ebony. And another reason, one of the, um, one of our mottos at Raven is, you know, and what we teach our members is, you know, being an investor <laughs> is also an owner. So you need to understand the differences between being an owner operator, right? And maybe an investor where you own a company, but you're not doing the day to day. And so Ebony, you made a great point with understanding if that's your passion, right? At one, at some point I want to transition into as a full-time investor, but right now I am operating a business and one day I want to transition out of that. There are some people who work full-time that are in our community and they're, they do not want to be entrepreneurs. They tried it and it didn't work for them, but they're saying, I'm going to invest here and get ownership of this company because I believe in this entrepreneurship, entrepreneur. And three tools, I'll just give um, a couple of books. If you want to get started in tech, which everything is tech now, right? And if you are interested in the tech industry, you're probably going to also hear that you need to raise venture. You'll probably hear that right away. And just a sidebar, you not you don't necessarily have to, okay? 95% of, com of companies who try to get venture are turned down. So just think about it. But there are alternative ways to fund your companies. So I would say, first of all, there's a book that's an easy read that I always liked, and it's called The Startup Checklist. And it's by David Rose, who is an investor. Um, and he has a huge company, well known at, out here in New York, especially. But the book is an easy read and it gives you a checklist of everything you need for your startup. And that will force you to make sure that you actually have a business to pursue, right? It'll force you to test things, you know, test your assumptions and prove what you're saying is the situation, is, is prove what you're saying is true. Um, another one would be venture deals. 
um, that's the book that you would read before, I would say, before you enter into any conversation with any investor. Um, understanding how venture financing and investor financing works before accepting checks is very, very important. And then another book that revolutionized my life and as an entrepreneur, you need to have um, focus, but you also need to be organized, right? Um, it's called The One Thing. And what I love the most is it taught me how to create time blocks in my day. It ta taught me how to focus, um, whether I'm with family or if I'm working on my business, right? So that helps me to be well and keep, keep up my wellness. Um, cause I don't believe in work life balance really doesn't exist. Um, but in this book, it really teaches you how to just how, how much progress you can make by just getting one thing done a day. And so those are just three books I would suggest. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to have to apologize because I was typing them <laughs> while you were saying them and I was, I was getting the, uh, the making sure that I got them down and the names uh, of the books correctly. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, answer panel because uh, I heard a I heard a consistent thing and I heard passion. And and James, you started it out by talking about empathy and that leading to passion and then developing the, the design uh, thinking or the, the design manner of embracing the design thought process. And Ebonique, you said, you know, follow your true passion. Don't rush into it. Remain curious. And I think that that's something that a lot of times we struggle with when we hear no a lot. And we hear no in a lot of the different arenas that we go in and we take our ideas. And uh, thank you, Tani, for the information that you shared, specifically the three books and you know, and, and then the confirmation that our two other panelists talking about passion is really a critical key and a, a cornerstone to assisting in moving forward in this arena. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna get a little I'm gonna get a little bit more granular. We don't have a lot of time left, but I'm I'm gonna go back to James and I'm gonna ask him a question that I'm, I'm hoping that he will be able to expound upon. There are several organizations recognized for black ingenuity, uh, such as the history manuals. And uh, what sets and what will set the Black Inventors Hall of Fame apart from those other organizations? Well, you know, we are pretty much joined at the hip in terms of our mission. And that mission is to enlighten the public to the pioneering achievements of black inventors over the past 400 years. We're talking thousands upon thousands upon thousands. What sets Black Inventors Hall of Fame uh, nonprofit as well as Black Inventors Hall of Fame Museum apart is the fact that it wants to be the conduit for the correct messaging regarding our experience. Oftentimes you will go online and you will see, for instance, Sarah Boone confused with Sarah Good. You'll see Bessie Blount Brown confused with Marie Van Britten. These are sisters who all have their own identity, yet through the advent of Google and the ease of electronic messaging, you come across so much missed messaging. So the first thing the Black Inventors Hall of Fame wants to do is correct the messaging correct the imaging, even correct the credits, okay? And for many a years, we have had so much misinformation related to the black inventor from technology, from the original Sams and Neds and Benjamin Montgomery's all up to today. Um, give you one example, my college mentor, Charles Harrison, he did not invent the Viewmaster but what he did when he redesigned it in 1958 was he gave it the toy appeal that would eventually lead it on to be one of the most iconic toys in the history of toy making. So that's probably what sets 
Black Inventors Hall of Fame a part is that we're going to do the investigations to make sure that when you come to us, the information is correct, and most importantly, the images are correct as well to the many of faces that uh, that you'll see today. Thank you, Danny. Connie, I'm going to come to you next, and I'm going to ask you as a major investing influencer, what would you tell your audience? Or what would be the information that you would feel I've got to share this about saving and investing? I know that we put money aside in our 401ks and we have a matching with our, our, our government matching or our companies match that and we put money in a savings account and we pay down our high interest debt. But <laughs> there's some next steps and some further things. These are the things that most of us know we should be doing, whether we're doing them or not. Right. So what, is, what is your recommendation or what would you share with, with, this, with this body? I would say that, as I mentioned earlier, um, finance, financial investing is a really hot topic right now. So I would say, be wary, do your due diligence, right? Before you go out and invest in an alternative investment that's risky, such as cryptocurrency, I'll put it out there, right? Make sure that you have maximized and diversified, and this is not financial advice. This is me sharing what I did, my experiences, right? <laughs> Make sure um, that you have diversified and max and maximized um, foundational and more conservative investments. When we're looking at an alter alternative investment such as cryptocurrency, which is in its, I mean, it's literally a baby, right? We don't have a history to look at, right? In the stock market, we do. We know the bull run has been going on. We don't really know where it's at right now, but <laughs> you know, the bull run. And so people who invested, started invested in 2010, right? Are reaping the benefits of that right after the recession, who invested before the recession. They went through the recession and they came out on the other side, okay, most, right? Um, there were some issues <laughs> and Ron, but you know, <laughs> you know, think there most people came out all right and now, right? Um, so what I would say is make sure that you have, you gain your knowledge, right, that you need. Um, you don't have to become an expert, but you definitely should have experts in your corner, right, that you can turn to. You definitely should know, have some knowledge yourself because this is your future. And you need to make sure that your expert is doing what they need to do if that's the route that you go. But make sure you have a foundation. You've maximized all of the things that the U.S. government opportunities that they give you and you have a matching at work, but are you maximizing that? Are you investing outside in investment vehicles, IRAs, funds outside of just what your job is, is matching? Because it's not enough. OK, I'm going to tell you, it's not enough. Um, if you are a newer person in your career and perhaps you're in tech or moving into tech, right? Um, do you understand how your options work, right? Do you, you know, you just, you got options, they're going to go public, you're going to be rich. Not quite. Do you have the money to buy those options when it's time? You know, there's a lot of things that you have to look into. So before you get caught up in the get rich, screen, get rich quick schemes, I hate to call it that, Make sure your foundations are right. Once your foundations are right and whatever you have left over that you can risk, then by all means, get the knowledge and go ahead and make investments. But your foundation has to be right. And it's more than just saving. Income and saving alone is not going to create wealth. It does not, right? Wealth is created through compounding. We have to invest it somehow and allow it to grow. That's how we create wealth. So I hope that's your question. We're, we're, that, was, that was amazing. Ebony, we're coming down to the end of our time period. And so my question for you, and, and I know that you have a pending patent application, and what I want you to share with us, and I know it won't take much, how is what you're working on, how do you anticipate it being a game changer? How will it 
Yeah. Um, but you prepped, uh, you gave us all the questions before you, but you didn't give me that one. <laughs> um, I, I, I see it as a game changer because I needed the game to change in order to participate in the art market. Um, so the current system is very difficult for somebody with a, um, I only have a $5,000 budget to pay on art every year. And for someone like me, um, that's very difficult for me to enter into the market. Um, even though that's a reasonable price for a piece of art and, and many artists would like my $5,000, but, um, the way the system works is that art galleries only tend to sell to 1 to 3 collectors. So that little art gallery that's down the street from you, they already know who's going to buy it. So they're picking items for the gallery for those 3 people. And if you don't have the, those 3 people's tastes, you're never going to find the stuff that you want. And so the whole system has to radically change in order for me to buy what I want. And through reading business books, I realized that if I have this problem, other people probably have this problem and they need the entire system to change. And that's what um, our app is trying to do. It's trying to build a system of change, um, but trying to do that in an inclusive way that includes everyone that is open to everyone. And that's a community structure. That's a game changer in and of itself. The fact that you are considering inclusion as a part of how the tool is going to work. Ladies and, and gentlemen, thank you so much for the time that you've taken out of your schedules. These answers have been amazing. I've actually taken notes during this session. I would like to invite each one of you individually to come to the Midwest region, the Elijah J. McCoy Midwest Regional United States Patent and Trademark Office in Detroit to uh, whether it's virtually or in person when we open up in order to share the knowledge and the experience that you provide. Next month is Women's History Month. Ladies, I will be reaching out to you because you're making history as we speak. I, I'm, I, I thank you again. I, I have to turn this over to Jade so that I don't get in trouble. But James, Tani, Ebonique, Thank you so much for all that you brought to this panel. And it is a, I appreciate having been the moderator for this. Have an amazing day and each and every one of you stay safe. Thank you, James. Thank you, James. Absolutely. Great, yes, thank you so much for that insightful dialogue. I think the main takeaway for me at least was to remain curious and look at passion as a driving force in all that we do, whether it is entrepreneurship, being an innovator, being an inventor, or even just in your own nine to five, looking at it as an opportunity to continue to pursue your dreams and your career aspirations. So thank you all. You can now disable your videos and audio as we head into our first break. If you guys can bring up the presentation for me. Thank you. So the USPTO offers many resources, many of which will I'll go in depth um, later on this afternoon. But I wanted to share two free legal assistance programs that include the Patent Pro Bono Program and the Law School Clinic Certification Program. These programs provide support to inventors and small businesses who are financially under-resourced. More information can be found on these websites, as well as in the recording from part one of this program once it becomes available. In the next slide, you will hear a video testimonial from one of the patent pro bono past participants, David Cox. My name is David Cox. I'm the founder and CEO of Wolverine Straps. I am honored to be part of the 2022 Black Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program. And I started to be an innovator and actually hold uh, two United States patents right now at this time. 
My third that I'm working on right now is Wolverine straps. Wolverine straps is a strap that actually goes on pipes. It's, it's used in the electrical industry for conduit, uh, in the plumbing industry for your regular plumbing pipes, and also for your gas pipes. What inspired me to come up with Wolverine straps is I was actually working on a job that I didn't have a lot of tools, and once I got done with the job, the pipe needed to be strapped. I had just a hammer at the time. If I had something that I can just tap into this, these studs and secure the pipes. So I created Wolverine straps to ad lib for that job. I also knew, you know, by being an inventor and uh, got two previous patents that I needed to move forward within the legal system. We kind of move with lightning speed because, you know, they changed the, the law. It used to be first to invent, now it's first to file. So we knew we had to move forward with it. At the time, the patent is pending and also have a design patent pending also. Right now, I do have three companies that's looking at my Wolverine straps as far as a good possible licensing deal or actually buying out the whole patent. One thing I gotta say, you gotta be patient in this whole process, dealing with anything, dealing with patents. I myself knew, you know, when I was 26 years old, you know, talking, you know, with a lot of people, but I didn't know. I mean, I had to find out for myself. There was no internet back then. But I knew I just couldn't be walking around showing my ideal around, you know, I, I used to actually uh, go to job sites on my very first uh, ideal, ask the, the tradesmen, have they ever used this product before? And they, and they said, uh, no, but they, said, they would say, well, listen, if you find out where I can get it, let me know. But there actually wasn't a product, it was a product that was actually I was thinking about. Then that's when I started looking into uh, getting a patent attorney. It was so important because see, documentation is really important. You know, back then you had to, you know, you document your idea because it was first to invent. You know, now it's first to file. It's so important because now you need to kind of move light and fast and you can't, you know, be showing your idea around. Make sure you that you have non-disclosure agreements where people have to sign uh, to protect yourself before, before uh, you might be able to go for a provisional patent or non-provisional patent. But you can find out all that good information, you know, by going to the patent office because they have all that great information. It's just pretty much hard work um, getting out here, making calls. You got to make shows. Um, you know, you might call somebody tomorrow, you know you need something from them. They might turn you down. Just call them the next day. You got to be persistent uh, because nobody's going to do this but you. I'm excited to welcome our next panel, which includes me as moderator. So I am delighted to be moderating a chat with our distinguished guest, Stacy Brown Philpot, um, who will be joining. She is, I think, yep, she's online. So just getting her video and sound on. But um, I would like to introduce Stacy Brown Philpot, who is the former CEO of TaskRabbit and has 20 years of consumer technology experience, leading the growth and scale of large and small enterprises in the digital economy. During her tenure, Stacy built a fast growing startup into a global business, charting the course in a new industry and launching local operations in more than 100 major markets in the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, France, Germany, and Spain. In 2017, Stacey led the successful acquisition of TaskRabbit by the IKEA Group. In addition to shaping the future of work, TaskRabbit is now a core driver of the e-commerce and services strategy for the world's largest furniture retailer with the mission of making everyday life easier for everyone. Prior to joining the company, she spent nearly a decade at Google heading online sales and operations. Stacy is a founding member of SoftBank's Opportunity Fund, a $100 million venture fund established to invest in Black, Latinx, and Native Hi. American entrepreneurs. And I am the investor. She's also on the board of directors for HP Inc., Nordstrom, Noom, StockX, Black Girls Code, and the Urban Institute. She holds a BS in economics from the Wharton School of Business and an MBA from Stanford University. Stacy lives in the San Francisco Bay Area with her husband and two daughters. I'd like to welcome you, Stacy. Hello. Hi, how are you? 
Doing well. Welcome to the stage. Thank you. <laughs> I think Thanks we. For having me. Well, wonderful. So I think we um, may or not. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. So on the back end, we have a number of tech staff helping. I just want to give them a huge shout out because it's not an easy feat doing this um, live. So <laughs> while we want technology to be in our favor, I do know that we run into issues here and there, but I'm grateful that you're here with us today, Stacey. It's nice to be so here. So with the background that I um, shared, you are originally from Detroit and received your undergraduate degree from my alma mater, University of Pennsylvania, the Wharton School of Business. So I wanted to first start by asking, how did these experiences shape you? Who or what inspired you? Yeah, well, my Detroit roots are run deep. I, I left Detroit when I was 17 years old, so I was to go to Penn. Um, so it was sort of a fish out of water experience. I don't know what your experience was like, but mine was certainly going from a community that was pretty much all black to a community that was 6% black. Although I was living in Philadelphia, which, you know, it was Philadelphia, so it felt more like the city that I came from. You know, I think I grew up in a household in the Midwest where we really focused on values, family values, education, and community. And I had four generations of women at one point in the house that I lived in. And so I learned a lot about independence, um, and being able to really take care of myself and others. Um, as you know, black women, we, we carry a lot on our shoulders and I come from a long line of strong black women who have done that. Uh, I got to Penn and, you know, Wharton was a rigorous environment. So I had to step up my game. I mean, I really thought that I didn't know what an Ivy League school was, but it, they taught me how to learn. Um, and I really, really focused on how to really be excellent at what I did. Um, while I was at Penn, I met my husband. So if the school gave me nothing, it gave me the gift of marrying the love <laughs> of my life. We've been married for 22 years. Um, but it was a it was a wonderful place to grow as somebody who cared about education, who loved science and, and math. Um, I ended up focusing on accounting and finance as my major um, and wanted to be an environment of intelligent people, which is exactly what Wharton was. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing that story. And it's um, similar in, this, in the sense that I gained my best friends, if nothing else, um, from graduating from Penn and nice. had, uh, a great time spending some um, time in Vermont last weekend with them. So um, it's great to have you here, another Penn alumna. And I know you're also celebrating a milestone anniversary for since you graduated 25 years, which congratulations to you. Um, it marks 10 years for me. So I uh, hope to see you at the reunion. I'll be there. <laughs> All family, kids and everything. Yeah. <laughs> great, yes. Maybe you get another Penn grad soon. So um, did you always know what career you wanted for yourself? So you mentioned um, uh, a number of women in your family who may have influenced your, your uh, school trajectory, but who or if what um, influenced your career? I, I always loved quantitative things. Like I was never a writer of things that were long. And so the beauty of going to Wharton was we had to write everything as memos, which was one page, which was perfect. And you just get me a son of a spreadsheet. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was happy. Um, that was the best thing for me. And so I, I knew I wanted to do something where I could leverage my passions around math um, and finance. And that's what took me into accounting and public accounting because it was about understanding a business from a financial perspective as a way to figure out how to help a business grow and also how to manage and be disciplined to make it sustainable. So I, I think I followed that passion and that interest. Um, I think it's also what brought me to tech too. There's a lot of data oriented people in tech that look at the merits of things um, more than the feelings in order to make decisions. And so that, that helped me feel comfortable and I think find my tribe when I got out here to the Bay Area. Having said that, as a leader, I've grown in 
to respect and, and know that leading with heart and understanding relationships and focusing on people is a hallmark of a great leader. And so I've had to build those skills as a leader over time, but I think deep down I'm a numbers girl and, and that's kind of what I've always sort of followed as a, in my career. Thank you. That, that definitely resonates with me. And for those who may know me on the call, um, would definitely agree that, um, quantitative conversations, I'm top notch when it comes to a little bit more of the emotional qualitative side. I, I tend to take, it takes more energy out of me. I'll say, <laughs> um, but that's, that's awesome. So for your current role, um, as the member of the SoftBank opportunity fund, can you share a little bit more insight into what that role entails and a little bit more about the opportunity fund? Absolutely. The, the opportunity fund was really following a, a purpose and everything I've ever done has really been about fulfilling a mission and a purpose. And TaskRabbit was that. We were, you know, helping people to, you know, live better lives by providing services that they couldn't otherwise get done. And then also creating jobs for other people um, who needed a way to find work. And it was a very inspiring role for me to have. And the decision to leave TaskRabbit was really based on my needs to figure out what the next chapter was gonna be for me, having sold the company to Ikea and built this wonderful legacy. Um, in June of 2020, the decision to create the Opportunity Fund came right after George Floyd was murdered. It was really just a group of people that I'd worked with and known through my Henry Crown Fellowship that we're all sitting around thinking, well, wow, we'd accomplished so much. We've built great businesses. We've created jobs. We've done all this and that somebody can get murdered in broad daylight on the street. And so we decided that it wasn't enough what we were doing. And so my friend Marcelo, who was the CEO at SoftBank at the time, said, let's create a big a venture fund to focus on investing in Black, Latinx, and Native American founders. And he we partnered with him, Paul Judge, who's based out of Atlanta, and Shu Nayata, who runs the SoftBank Latin America Fund, to create a $100 million fund, which was the largest at its time. I'm proud to say that there are other Black investors who've raised more than that now, which is fantastic, and that should keep going. But it was the largest at its time, and we focused. We focused on Black, Latinx, and Native American. We were very clear in that focus. But we invested in all sectors across technology and all stages from seed stage and beyond. Uh, the reason why we focused just on that community is because we wanted to be very intentional about changing the face of wealth creation. And the only way to do that is to show intent and focus and be intentional. To date, we've invested in. 70 companies or more than 70 companies, over $75 million. 60% uh, of our founders and CEOs are African American, 40% are Latinx. We have zero Native American, and it's because we haven't worked hard enough. It's not because they're not out there. And that's something that we're focused on working on this year in 2022. So I'm very proud of what this fund has been able to do over the last you know, 18 months and really looking forward to the types of companies that we can continue to invest in and grow in the future. Over half of our companies have either raised or in the process of raising an additional round of funding at a higher valuation, which has shown us that, you know, A, there's no pipeline problem. We, we looked at over 2,000 companies to get to 70. And B, you know, there are founders out there who are black and brown who are capable of building amazing businesses if we focus with intent on helping those businesses start, um, accelerate, and grow. Wow, that is incredible. And congratulations uh, to the 75 companies that have already received funding. And so um, I know you mentioned that there's, with a follow-up um, to this question, um, your outreach efforts to reach the Native American um, entrepreneurs and business owners. What are your strategies? How are you um, reaching out to those communities if you can share? Yeah, last year we spent 
a lot of time meeting with different people in the Native American community, people who are connected from an entrepreneurial perspective, from a small business perspective, and at the college level. And one of the things that we learned is that many of the companies that we would normally invest in are much further along in other communities than in the Native American community. And so one of the things that we're exploring is how do we make earlier stage investing investments earlier than seed stage in order to help incubate some of these companies to get to the point where we would naturally find them and discover them. Um, the other piece is cultural. We learned a lot about the culture and really went deep to figure out what is it about the Native American culture that where there's overlap with technology so that these are the kinds of companies that people from this culture want to start and can develop and grow. And so some of the things that I, I won't share all the details on we're doing is to really immerse ourselves further in the culture in order to really refine our investing strategy. I love I love that um, you mentioned that because I think even um, with some of these communities, the the opportunity is there in terms of there are entrepreneurs, there are business owners that represent these under historically underrepresented groups. And I think what we're even realizing as an agency and other companies I've worked for in the past is that sometimes it's not the barrier to access, it's more or less the reach. So I think what you're doing is, is smart and brilliant in how you're engaging with them directly and seeing what opportunities are there and how you can invest perhaps at an earlier stage in the seed funding level. So kind of switching gears a little bit, um, I want to go more more in depth um, with your own background and your uh, career history. And so, as the former COO and CEO of TaskRabbit, what were some of your biggest accomplishments? And um, to that, what were some of the challenges? Yeah, we we had. I mean, the company well, was a roller coaster ride of of startups, and I think. There's probably people listening to this who are on some element of that roller coaster, about to go down that first, you know, hill where the stomach and the butterflies, and or you're going through the corkscrew where you're looping and you're not sure if you're going to ever get out of that loop. And and that's we had all of that. I mean, some of the bigger accomplishments was our expansion internationally, where we first went to the UK from the US and changed our product to be a higher performing product from a fulfillment and growth perspective, which allowed us to scale the business a lot faster. Um, we also sold the company, as you know, to IKEA. And in that process, you know, really, I mean, I was very proud that we found a home for TaskRabbit with a company that was long-term thinking, that was thinking about how do we build this business for scale and for growth. And we launched four countries and 18 months while I was still there. And I think they are continuing to do more launches. My vision was to bring TaskRabbit all over the world. And now we're in seven countries and the company continues to grow. So I'm very proud of, of that accomplishment. You know, the challenges were very real. Running a marketplace where human beings are on both sides of it is difficult because there's, you can build science and you can build a matching algorithm and you can have all the AI in the world to predict human behavior. And then you figure out that actually the limits of AI are still there where humans don't always act in the way that you want them to act. So we were constantly trying to figure out how do we make sure we had enough supply and enough demand to meet the market and make the market at any point in time. That became especially challenging in 2020 when we had a pandemic happen where our business is essentially to go into people's houses and everybody was afraid to go into someone's house. So how do we keep the marketplace open in a safe way so that people could earn money and taskers could still have a way to earn an income in a time when, if you remember, it wasn't clear what masks were. We didn't know how the virus was really being transmitted. And a lot of people were losing their jobs because stores and restaurants and a variety of other fields were closing down those businesses. And so we had to shift very quickly to a world where we provided the PPE to taskers so they could continue to perform tasks 
and create new protocols so they can do it in a safe way. So all of that was over Google Meet and Zoom <laughs> with my kids running in the background because they were at school. So that was, that was, you know, that was challenging. <laughs> I'm glad you said that because I, many of us can relate, you know, I think um, what the pandemic has taught me is that being adaptable and um, I guess open to the unexpected is key and especially as an entrepreneur too, I think it, it's important um, to recognize that not everything is going to go as planned and to be prepared for any changes or pivots even in your business plan and in the business trajectory. So thank you for, for sharing that with us. So um, going back to the entrepreneurship side too, I think um, your role as um, one of the founding members of the SoftBank Opportunity Fund, you come across a number of businesses. I know you mentioned you've looked through vetted 2,000 or more businesses to come to the 75. And so what aspects do you um, look for, I would say, in companies that come with their pitch to decide whether or not it's a fundable opportunity. Yeah, we we look for you know great entrepreneurs who have big a big vision. Um, they have an idea, and there's something that needs to happen to bring that idea to life, and they have a lot of passion around creating that idea. We look for markets where there's a large TAM total addressable market that is a huge opportunity where even if a number of players enter that market, this company has a chance to dominate it um, and exist in it where you're not fighting for share very early on. You want a market that's growing. We look for founders and CEOs who are self-aware, who know what their strengths are, um, what their weaknesses are, and are able to attract talent to complement what it is that they don't bring to the table. They want to bring in the very best people who can deliver and perform at levels that, at, that are much higher than them. And we look for people who can adapt and be flexible, which really means they've got to have a good amount of grit and perseverance to navigate the very the challenges that will never become in starting a company. Uh, we found that many of our black and brown founders come with that because of whatever it is that they've gone through to get to where they are has taught them a number of skills in building grit and perseverance. And so it's, it's sort of an easy check mark to make when you present and pitch to the opportunity fund. Wonderful. And um, do you find, or have you, come across that many of the entrepreneurs or businesses that you vetted, do they have a form of intellectual property? And how important is that to your fund in particular, but in general when considering venture capital or other forms of funding? Well, certainly having a competitive advantage is what's important. And so when we look at an investment, we look at what are all the areas where this company has a competitive advantage. In many cases, it's not a strong IP. They don't have intellectual property that cannot be replicated or stolen because of the nature of the businesses tend to be software companies and they're open sourcing a lot of their development work. But in the event that they do, and there are a couple of companies that we've invested in that have patents, uh, underway already for IP or, or, or have already received a patent, it certainly does help. What helps more is how they leverage it and how the business changes over time. At the stage that we're investing is less about do you have IP and it's more about can you understand what's happening in a market so that you can capitalize on the opportunity um, at, at a given point in time. And so we're looking for founders and CEOs who can, who can do that. Yeah, that's, um, that's a great point. I think, um, when we consider intellectual property, there's many forms of it. Of course, patents is being, uh, one of them, the, the three that I'm thinking of, so including trademarks and copyrights. So I can imagine, especially in the software business and tech business that there may be more the, the copyright um, trademark line of, of 
intellectual property, the patents included. And I think, you know, it is one of those things that it does create competitive advantage to your point. Um, but I do agree that looking at how markets shift and how you as an entrepreneur are navigating those shifts is important and having that clearly defined. It, it is. I'll give you a funny story around trademarks is sort of the task rabbit um, trademark. And there was a debate um, early on on what do we call the taskers and people would call them rabbits. And it turns out when you launch in the UK, that's actually not appropriate because um, mm -hmm. it has a different connotation. And so we had to really go through a process to figure out what is the, what's a globally acceptable phrase that we could use um, for our taskers in our community and also make it relevant to the brand because part of the trademark should be something that reinforces the brand because that helps with marketing, especially for a consumer business. So I thought you'd appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. I um, my, my master's is actually in business with a concentration in entrepreneurship. And so I've taken many global entrepreneurship courses that discuss just that. How does your business translate in other countries? Um, especially when you're considering services and products, but also the need. <laughs> so yeah, I, I definitely come across a number of companies who've had to really evaluate what uh, name and service or product they provide, uh, depending on the consumer and the country in which they're operating. So in a recent interview with Black Enterprise about your decision to join StockX as the first female board member, you share that we have a responsibility to push a change and lead in the way that we want to see other leaders behave and act. Um, so one, I wanna ask, who are you referring to when you say we, and then what has leadership taught you and what qualities do you think make an effective leader? Yeah, um, that quote, what came out, it was sort of used in the Black Enterprise article, but the, the, the essence of that quote was really following uh, the murder of George Floyd. And there was a lot of political conversations around what was going on. Um, and then there was a question of well, what's the role of the CEO? What's the role of the leader of a team or a function in navigating through this, not only are we in a pandemic, but now we have a social justice movement that's going on. And so my response, the we is the, res is the responsible leader. It's the CEO or the CXO who is leading a team of people in a world where you can't just check all of the things that are going on with us at the door anymore. We are bringing into the work environment many things, not only our political beliefs, but just our feelings about what's going on in the world. And I think we all have a collective responsibility as a leader to acknowledge that and respond. And so what I've learned from that is, you know, not just assuming that we're going to just come to work and be a robot and like leave. And all of a sudden we're dealing with like being afraid of the police. Like that's that that can't happen. And so as a leader, I've learned you have to really accept people for who they are and all of who they are and encourage all voices to be heard and all perspectives to be shared and create a work environment where that is true for everyone and all people. And that that's an additional task above and beyond, you know, meeting your revenue targets and your profitability goals and the growth goals and all the things that your investors want you to achieve. We have a responsibility to, to take a stand on things and pursue what's right and what's fair and what's equitable, uh, along with some of those quantitative things that we are held accountable for as leaders. Thank you for sharing that. And I think um, many will agree on this call that people are really what make the business. And I think, you know, ultimately we all have our personal and professional um, concerns on a day-to-day -day and being able to voice that openly and have a leader that supports that open dialogue is important. And I think even aspiring entrepreneurs as they're considering who to invite on their, their leadership team, having that same commonality among the group that we wanna have this space is going to be important as we shift um, 
this, you know, the corporate environment, so to speak. So I think we have time for one last question. Um, and I want to preface that we, we did have a number of people um, submit questions and what they're hoping to uh, learn from these programs that we're hosting this week and last week. And so with that, what is your advice um, for entrepreneurs and innovators and what resources or opportunities can you share? Yeah, I would say, you know, one of the things that we're really proud of with the Opportunity Fund is that 14% of all of our founders are women compared to 2% across all of BC. And so the opportunities are growing for entrepreneurs and diverse entrepreneurs. There are a number of funds out there that are looking to invest in great businesses led by diverse people. Note that I didn't say diverse people. Invest in great businesses led by diverse people. And I'd, I'd love to be you know, a resource and the opportunity fund to be one of those options for people who are raising capital. So please think of us in that respect. I would say, you know, if you're building something and starting something, you're like out in the desert by yourself, you see the future. There's, you have no idea where that oasis is going to be um, of water and, you know, nourishment, but just keep going. I mean, the passion that you have for what you're doing, keep going with that passion and don't forget that relationships and networks matter because those are the things that are going to help you find that oasis, but also maybe be that next great employee that you hire, that next great customer and partner that you sign up. And so often in our communities, we think we don't need help and we don't know how to ask for help. And if I've learned nothing in the course of my career, it's how to really ask for what you want and be very clear and bold about it. So that would be my advice. Thank you. I appreciate that so much, Stacey. I appreciate you taking the time today to share some of these useful gems, information, and your experience. It is definitely a pleasure. I hope to meet you in person soon. Um, but I thank you and our um, panelists from earlier today. Thank you all as well. Thank so, you all. Um, See you at reunion. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Bye, Stacey. Thank you. So uh, if we can bring back up the slides, I'm going to close today's event. Thank you. So again, as I mentioned earlier, the USPTO has many online resources, programs, and services to educate the public about the importance of intellectual property protection and to help all innovators reach their full potential. So while I don't have enough time to provide information about all of our valuable resources, I'm going to share information about a few. So of course, you can navigate to the USPTO.gov homepage we welcome visitors to our site by highlighting the innovator being showcased in our Journeys of Innovation series, a series that shares the inspiring stories of innovators. This month is one of the esteemed panelists from last week's program, Prolific Inventor and Walt Disney Imagineer, Lanny Smoot, as well as other Journeys of Innovation series, which I will discuss in a few minutes. Also on our homepage, there are links to information to help you get started with the patent or trademark application process, navigate through the patent or trademark process once you have filed an application, and maintain your patent or registered trademark. From the homepage to the left of the large question mark beneath the patent basics and trademark basics link, there is a link to our inventor and entrepreneur resources page. Next slide. This page um, is a great resource for innovators at any stage of the process of protecting their creative works, their intellectual property. For our inventors, small business owners, and entrepreneurs that are just getting started, this page contains links to information that can help you learn more about the types of intellectual property, including patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets, and the important steps to take before you apply for a patent or apply to your register your trademark such as links to information on intellectual property basics, how to conduct a patent or a trademark search. It's important to conduct a patent search to see if your invention has already been published or patent in a trademark search to ensure that the trademark you want to register is available and to help avoid unintended infringement of someone else's mark. There are links to our resources that can assist you with filing your patent or trademark application. 
And while we recommend that you have an attorney, the USPTO will provide assistance, but not legal advice to help you with filing your patent or trademark application. In addition to accessing this page via our USPTO homepage, you can use the URL uspto.gov slash inventors. Next slide. If you are new to IP, don't worry. We are your USPTO and have dedicated USPTO staff who are happy to assist you. The USPTO operates a headquarters and Eastern Regional Office out in Alexandria, Virginia. We also have four additional regions across the nation. Our Silicon Valley office, Rocky Mountain office, and Midwest regional offices. All of our offices combined create a regional presence for the USPTO and gives inventors, entrepreneurs, and small business owners the added benefit of a USPTO presence in every time zone in the United States. Beneath the USPTO offices section, there is a list containing all states to include the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico for you to select from to access information about resources that are available in your state. You can find information such as free patent and trademark legal service, services, as I mentioned earlier in the program, finding a registered patent attorney or agent, as well as you can go through the state page to find other resource centers that may be near you. Next slide. So if you have general questions about the patent trademark processes, such as how to start, what forms to use, the patent trademark assistance centers are here to help you. If they don't have the answer, they'll connect you with the appropriate USPTO personnel. Our assistance centers representatives are available Monday through Friday from 8.30 a.m. to 8 p.m., except for federal holidays. For more information about the Inventors Assistance Center, please visit uspto.gov forward slash inventor assistance. For more information about the Trademark Assistance Center, please visit uspto.gov trademark assistance. Next slide. So there are a number of uh, helpful uh, programs as well as webinars to help you learn more about the patent trademark processes. They include the Path to a Patent and Trademark Basics Bootcamp. You can learn more about these programs via the links shown on this slide or visit uspto.gov forward slash events page, where you'll find information about other free educational programs that will be of interest to you. Next slide. As I mentioned earlier, we welcome you to our website by highlighting the innovator we are currently featured in our Journeys of Innovation series. Each month, the USPTO seeks to inspire and encourage innovation by sharing relatable stories that chronicle the journeys of inventors and entrepreneurs. We shed light on where they got their start, the challenges they faced, and what it took to bring their ideas to the marketplace and their brands to life. These stories also emphasize the importance of creating and protecting intellectual property and the critical role it plays in innovation. Next slide. So, of course, we have a number of upcoming events, including our women on, women's entrepreneurship program taking place on March 2nd, 16th, and 30th. And we'll have a number of wonderful speakers, and we encourage you to attend and participate by going to www.uspto.gov forward slash WES. We also want you to mark your calendar for August 10th through the 12th for Invention Con 2022. Again, you can learn more about our other upcoming events by visiting uspto.gov forward slash events. I also want you to be on the lookout for an upcoming survey via email, as well as the presentation for today's event. We encourage you to complete it as a, as a valuable feedback um, resource for us and want you to continue providing useful content and events. So can you um, go to the last slide? And I just wanna thank you all again for participating in today's event with us. Be sure to tune in for next month's events as well as other upcoming programming. And if you have any comments or questions about today's program, please email us at togetherinnovation at uspto.gov or innovationoutreach at uspto.gov. Thank you.